so we'll uh, start the discussion my name is sharat i have been teaching here since 2018 at shankar academy i teach a lot of your faces team new have you sat in my class none of you which batch you have sat which batch are you b sadhana batch b 1 have you been in class or online online huh? don't remember seeing you how about you guys batch 6 batch 4 the new batch you guys are batch batch 6 okay batch 6 is still some time away i'm still at batch 4 right now batch 4 and 5 so sorry 3 and 5 is what i'm going so i'll get to you guys quite soon um anyway so um the reason why we are having this orientation we had one orientation already a couple of uh, maybe a month or so back uh but i don't know whether your batch had started at that point of time or whether you had got the information now we are on the verge of starting our optional classes uh, somewhere um in the next couple of weeks say september 21 that weekend or the weekend after that we are planning to start uh, the optional class with respect to economics okay so what i'll do first is i'll uh, um just give you an overview of the syllabus and then i'll talk about how the classes are going to happen what how many days and all those details i'll tell you that i'll tell you about that um then if you have any questions you can raise those questions and you can we can have a discussion about that okay i'm going to keep it very short not very elaborate for long time so when i say short maybe i'm expecting at most an hour within an hour i think we should be done beyond that i don't see the point of it okay um and some of you may have already made up your mind about the optional you might just want to know what is inside some of you may be considering it as an optional so after i tell you give you the overview you ask me your queries and we we'll let's see practically whether you should uh, consider this as an optional or not okay online like that is there some response that you are getting okay uh, am i audible to people only have they responded have they responded respond panirukanga okay all right so uh, you know with every optional there are two papers paper 1 and paper 2 each paper is worth 250 marks you are familiar with that um so paper 1 is entirely the theory that is behind economics um the theory in the sense uh, what are all the various economists uh, what have the various economists um say, spoken about various aspects of the uh, the subject in the sense basic concepts like uh, demand you might be aware of it supply how does production take place this is what economics is all about how does production take place what are the factors that underlie it so there are different schools of thought uh one set of economists who believe these are the foundational principles of economics there are some other economists who believe that no there is a different perspective to it all of them centered around the same region so that is what we are going to focus on in paper 1 the different schools of thought and economics itself is broken down into different branches of study uh the different branches that we have one is microeconomics uh next is macroeconomics broadly these are the two branches that is all that is there however we further divide it into specific areas so there is microeconomics there is macroeconomics in macroeconomics actually a sub segment of macroeconomics is what is this uh, money the area of money what role does money play in production and all those things so actually although it's given as a separate area because it's a different school of thought but it's actually something that will go under the heading of macroeconomics all right so there is the area of money monetary economics Uh, along with it there is also an area called finance where the focus is on public finance uh, public finance is slightly deviating in the sense uh, what does the government what is the logic of their taxation system and what how do they spend and those aspects of it more than uh, the theories that are given by economists the focus there on is on the logic or the thought process behind the government okay then we have an area called as international economics which again is macro level study so broadly it can be considered as macro economics as well but because it's a specific area and there are very specific theories with respect to international trade which are different from the theories that are there in general macro economics we study it as a separate school of thought uh, international trade separate set of theories for the entire thing so that is international economics and finally we have an area called as growth and development okay growth and development is a more modern approach towards understanding economics uh, the conventional economic thought is that as we get more and more income um, the uh, situation of the country is improving but is that truly so uh, there is a belief that not really just because there is more money doesn't mean that people's life is of very good level there are other factors to consider as well such as 
that income how is it distributed among the population and then other factors like health education how is that improving access to resources some sectors not growing other sectors growing so is there a balance in the growth theories with respect to that or commentaries with respect to that that is something growth and development is about it's a very significant evolving area even from upc exam perspective there is growing significance to this area in comparison to every passing year compared to the past it's more significant now and the significance is only going to increase going forward that is with respect to upc exam but with respect to general understanding across the world itself we are moving more and more towards embracing these kind of concepts as we can see from uh, nobel prize is being awarded newer theories being uh, conveyed with respect to this developmental area of economics okay so these are the five areas that we have with respect to paper 1 okay this is a basic idea about it i will come uh, a little more deeper into this concept after i tell you a little about paper 2 paper 2 is not about the theories at all so there is no discussion about any theories given by any particular individual or the concept related to that is not there it's purely how has the indian economy progressed so it's like economic history this is like a history paper but with respect to economy alone economics alone indian economy what has been its journey like and we are not going to talk about your ancient or medieval period we are starting with the modern what you learn in history as modern history is with the arrival of the britishers so we are also going to restrict ourselves to the arrival of the britishers with the arrival of the britishers when they arrived in india what was the economic situation in india like what were their role in um, leaving india in a certain place uh, in 1947 when they left in 1947 which is what we first learn as indian economy in pre independence era okay so before the britishers left or at the time when in britishers left what was the situation like various theories that have been there various concepts you might have you might learn about this in history itself some of these concepts you might hear about a uh, system of uh, land called as zamindari system and all those these kind of different kind of systems that were there introduction of railways is something that uh, britishers take credit for all those pre independence concepts so that is one segment then we have uh, indian economy after independence so broadly only these two segments pre independence and post independence but post independence itself there is a significant landmark that we have in india 1991 being the landmark period till 1991 india as a country as an economy was of one type where we were very hesitant to interact with the rest of the world we were very hesitant to allow private participation we would allow but very restrict in a very restricted manner okay so that changed in 1991 because of certain events that happened at that point of time so we introduced a completely new set of economic reforms during that period new economic reforms which resulted in globalization india becoming a part of the global economy uh, for which privatization was very essential so private participation was encouraged after that and government started staying away from business activities gradually and finally liberalization to ensure that private freely comes and participates rules were made uh, much more relaxed than in the past so after this change this is a landmark period so we divide the post independence indian economics into uh, the pre liberalization era and the post liberalization era so this is a and b so broadly two areas pre independence post independence and post independence is further divided into pre liberalization and post liberalization in terms of uh, the syllabus construction so this is what is given as such a long one that is all so this is the syllabus that is here okay now with respect to paper 1 the subject does not grow at all it is not dynamic it's a very static subject uh, there is only so much to learn that will never change as long as the syllabus remains the same and syllabus doesn't change frequently as you would know as long as the exam pattern is like this and the syllabus is like this that is not going to change once you prepare and keep it ready there is no addition that is going to be required there it's the same thing that you will have to be uh, revising repeatedly okay that is with respect to paper 1 in paper 2 two areas inside it we will divide it into three because that's how the syllabus is doing pre liberal pre independence what change can happen it's history pre liberalization also nothing can change pre 1991 but in the post liberalization most of it is still going to be the same just that every year whatever the government if, if the government introduces something new a new policy is introduced a new foreign investment policy is introduced or a new mechanism to encourage certain kinds of industries like micro small and medium enterprises all the schemes that we come across in the news no so some some things like that or concepts which are discussed in the news an economist comes and says you know what this would be a good idea in india or an rbi governor or a chief economic advisor makes a comment saying this is a, a plan that we have for india for future so these kind of comments that becomes of significance those we'll have to keep updating ourselves with and that is only natural because as administrators you are expected to have that kind of a, an updation with respect to your knowledge so it is not something that is going to 
uh, be a big trouble in updating. So largely, it's a static area. Just that the only the most current events that are happening that needs to be updated with every passing. That is that goes with any UPC preparation. That updation has to happen. Okay. So this is the a basic idea about paper one and paper two with respect to its syllabus as well. Okay. Now we'll go detail in detail into each of the topics and subtopics inside it. Although I say paper one is confined and static in nature. This static area is quite vast. Okay, so that is something that sometimes people find as a, a a challenge when it comes to preparing for economics. Paper two is still something that people can handle because it's just there is no concepts over there. You just have to remember what are the events that have happened. That is all that is there in paper two. With paper one, uh, the concepts are numerous, and what is mentioned in the syllabus is actually sometimes smaller. What you have to study is something beyond that as well. In one line, what they have given in the syllabus, you have to study a lot more from the uh, study knowledge perspective. Okay, so it is quite vast. It is static, but it is quite vast. There is no denying that. Paper one, especially, is quite vast. Okay, um, I I'm not going to make any comparison with some other subject. It's not a comparative study, uh, but the subject is vast, and I'll show you why it is vast. Because um, microeconomics is a separate area of study itself. And when we come to macroeconomics, the concepts there is actually a significant deviation in how we look at concepts itself. The focus area of microeconomics is completely different, and the focus area of macroeconomics is completely different. Which means there is very less of overlap between concepts that happen. Basic principles will be there. There is a concept of demand. There is a concept of supply. But beyond that, everything that we learn is going to be. Very very different. It's like two separate subjects that we are learning. That is how different it is going to be. So it is like that. Okay. And when we look at it, so I told you the money is also a part of macro. It's a continuation of the theories. Okay. But when we come to something like international economics, international economics again, although has overlapping areas with the other two areas, micro and macro, it will still have very different kinds of principles because we are looking at why do countries indulge in trade with each other. Okay, what is the logic? That's a completely different school of thought altogether. So it's like a third new subject that we are learning. Okay, three new subjects. Plus we have the area of growth and development, which takes from micro and macro study, but gives a completely different perspective to it as well. So look at it as a fourth different area of study. So you can say there are four separate subjects that you have to learn, with slight overlap here and there. Okay, but broadly two micro and macro. But the other areas are also for for the purpose of our preparation. You have to look at it like different subjects, and you have to have it in your mind that okay, there are four different subjects for you to learn. In fact, even this public finance is a separate area of study with very less of overlap. But the significance of public finance, this heading in money, we have banking and finance is public finance. The significance of that from the exam perspective is very very less. In terms of our classroom, also we are not going to focus much on it because UPC doesn't focus much on that area. As a result, I am not focusing on that. So we say four different areas of study: microeconomics, macroeconomics, um, international economics, and uh, uh, growth and development. Okay. Why am I not including monetary? Because when I mention macro, you will understand why that is so. Now let's look at microeconomics. Looks like the easiest topic that is there because there are only four lines given. Okay. But it starts actually not with this it starts with market structure so this should be the first line that they should have given market structure they talk about uh, so okay actually there is a reason why they have given marshallian and walrasian approaches to price determination is what is conventionally referred to as the perfect competition that is a type of market perfect competition and then we have other approaches monopolistic competition duopoly oligopoly they have not explicitly given monopoly as well so these are The different market structures that are there. So in a market, what happens is people come and try to buy commodities. Companies come and try to sell their commodities. So the interaction is what happens in the market. However, to get to the market, we have a large area to cover, like what are what is meant by demand and what are the various theories and concepts associated with demand. How do we understand demand? How do we measure demand? how do we understand all of those things and certain other concepts like how does demand change with price there is something called as the law of demand to prove the law of demand and how does it change with respect to price that is an entire whole area of learning one is demand the other is supply same logic 
what is the logic of supply what is the law of supply and how to derive it and what are the various other concepts associated with supply these are two separate areas of discussion which gets combined in the market in the syllabus because they have given advanced macroeconomics they are assuming that you would already know all concepts related to this demand and supply and so they have not explicitly mentioned in the syllabus this one line or these two lines in the syllabus before we get to that there will be about in terms of number of pages there will be about 500 pages of learning in a book of 1000 pages 500 pages is not even mentioned in the syllabus we have to cover that okay after we finish this whole thing is what we'll get into different market structures and once we get here the movement will be very quick to get here is the slowest pace because a lot of people would not be previously exposed to economics as a subject you may not have i don't know with respect to you uh, some people a lot of people who come for economics optional do not have a background in economics they take just pick the subject and they come here with maybe engineering background or maybe some background in bcom and all those they might not have studied the uh, subject to this depth but it's not just them people who have studied economics in college also come and say you know what uh, i don't remember the basics and uh, basics was not covered properly in college so all those things in fact some people even come and attend the classes not for optional purposes but just to gain the knowledge of it because they are preparing for some other exam we have had students like that in the past as well so it is going to be from the very basic that we'd be covering and there is no other way that we can look at it because it's not that because the syllabus only this much question will be asked only from this questions will be asked from the area of demand and supply as well why because they are assuming that if you know this you would know that as well and if they ask questions from there you should be in a position to write is what they're expecting okay so although it is just a four line syllabus there is a lot more to it than that this one area microeconomics itself and our entire course duration is six months we are starting in uh, towards end of september so october let's keep october november december january february march it will take us six months of those six months two to two and a half months will go explicitly for microeconomics preparation itself covering microeconomics in class the rest of the areas are going to be comparatively easier to cover okay because once we get to this the rest of the syllabus will actually move quickly in terms of volume although it's a macroeconomics a separate school of thought it can be covered quite quickly the content inside it is comparatively less because there is broadly basically two schools of thought there is what is called as the classical school of thought and then there is the post that there is a school of thought called as keynesian school of thought these two schools of thought are there these are the basic fundamental subsequently everything is corrections to this updations to this there is post classical post or neoclassical neo keynesian those updations will go in between this is where a third school of thought came about that is monetary economics where they feel that money is what determines everything so that is also a part of macroeconomic school of thought itself so that that is why the microeconomic part although it might seem small is actually quite a large area for us to cover in class okay of these a and c is something that we'll cover to begin with okay then we'll move into other areas of study like macroeconomics and all those things because what you find here as b alternative distribution theories is something that we will be able to understand only after understanding macro so it is macro thought that is actually reflected over here so without macro learning we won't be able to understand the alternative distribution um, alternate distribution theories or even the modern welfare criteria that is also something that will require us to have some other knowledge from other places to be able to understand that so micro we'll start with a and c we'll finish that that part of micro we'll keep it aside then we'll go to macro monetary international we'll cover all of those things and the last thing that we'll be covering again in paper one would once again be micro where we'll be covering b and d so we'll start with micro we'll end with micro and we'll cover the other areas in between okay now coming to advanced macroeconomics what they have given here is one classical next is keynesian then neoclassical neo is an, an updated version of classical new classical these are two different time periods they are both are new classical only updations to classical one happened earlier one happened later that's why two different names and then there are they have not explicitly given with keynes theory also there is an updation neo or uh, new keynesian theories and all those things would be there then with respect to money what they have given is again theories with respect to demand and supply for money keynes theory of demand for money you see the names be repeating so keynes this person who gave the theory also had a comment about theories with respect to money there is a classical theory of money that is called as a quantity theory of money okay 
So these are all theories with respect to money, again related to the area of macroeconomics itself. So this, we would look at it as one branch of study. Two and three A is one branch of study. We'll cover till the Keynesian, Keynes part. Then we'll come to money because that is the order in which it happened. Uh, because they have conventionally, this is what is macro is why they have given here. In terms of how we cover in class, we'll cover the initial part of macro. We will finish uh, monetary because that is the order in which happened. After that, we'll go back and cover the subsequent Keynesian, newer versions of cl uh, classical and Keynesian. With that, that part would be over. This public finance is a standalone area. It will not take us more than, say, four hours of entire learning. That's all. Four hours, which means one class is enough because that is all that the focus is there from the exam perspective. The learning that we are going to do is not, remember, we are not here to become a graduate in economics. We are here to write an exam. And whatever is the focus in the exam, that is what we are going to be focusing on as well. Of the 400 marks of questions that are asked, you are aware that your films questions will be 400 marks, right? You have to attempt 250. They have given eight questions of which you have to choose five and write. Okay, that's how the pattern is. Which means eight questions of which you have to attempt only five. Five into 50 is 250 marks. Each question carrying 50 marks is how it's going to be. There are, of course, going to be subdivisions and all those. Of the entire 400 marks, maybe 20 to 25 marks is what is going to come from this public finance area. It's a area of very less importance. So our focus in class is also only going to be that much. So that's not an area of concern as a separate branch of study. Okay. Then we have international economics. Again, international economic theories can be divided into two parts as they have given it themselves. This A and B is actually one part. There are the conventional uh, theories of trade. Again, we call it as the classical version and an updated neoclassical version of it. And then there are modern. So there is the classical. Uh, that is what is given here in the first line. Uh, then we have... Uh, have they given it as modern? Oh yeah, here itself they are given old and new theories of trade. So there is the old one, there is the updation to that, and then there is the modern theories of trade plus this tariff part. That is one segment, tariff and quota and all those things. That is one segment. Okay, and then the second segment is about the concept of balance of payments. Again, for those who are not familiar with the concept of balance of payments, you may not immediately get it. But it's about again about trade, but the money aspect of trade. The first part is about why does trade take place and what are the theories associated with that. But the second part is about in trade, money is involved. So if there is money going out and money coming in, is there a balance there? That is what is called as balance of payments. If there is a mismatch, how to bring about a balance between the two? So that is balance of payments, adjustments. How does the adjustment happen? Theories with respect to that. So these are the two different areas of focus. At the end of it, we also have to talk, talk about uh, trade unions and agreements, how WTO as an organization was formed and all those things. That is another area, certain agreements that are there. This area alone overlaps a little bit with Indian economy because India is also a member of uh, WTO. But when we study WTO here, our focus is on WTO as a whole, not about India and WTO, just WTO. But when we study this in paper two, it's about India and WTO. WTO with respect to India alone is what we'll focus on there. Here, every concept that is relevant with respect to WTO, we have to learn. India doesn't matter in paper one. Paper two, India is the only thing that matters. Okay. And growth and development is, again, broadly something that can be classified into two. The conventional growth and development theories, and irrespective of what are all the various uh, words or the headings that they have given over here, broadly two areas. One is the conventional growth and development area. The second is environmental economics. They might have mentioned here in just one line, development and environmental sustainability. But because of the growing importance of climate, climate change and all those things, UPC has, has, been, has been asking two or even three questions uh, equivalent to what is asked from uh, public finance or maybe even more than what is asked from public finance in the areas of environmental study. Unfortunately, we don't have any standard reference books for this environmental area. We'll have to just do random online searches and learn. So what, we'll, what is going to be the approach that we are going to take is we are going to take questions that have been asked in the past and focus on these, those areas and have discussions about it based on things that we read up. Maybe more or less like an assignment that we can have where we can all uh, pitch in and because there are no standard concepts to teach or as such. So we'll take a look at how the previous questions have been like and we'll have to update ourselves according to that. So that is the environment area row. But there are certain uh, existing concepts in the other conventional part like they have given something called as Harrod model. There is a model called as Domer's model. The Harrod Domer combined is also there. Then there is a Lewis model. Balanced growth is a separate concept. Unbalanced growth is a separate concept. 
all those specific names are there as well okay with respect to each model of growth so there is a solo model that is there and similarly many such models are there say roughly about uh, 15 to 20 models again it's going to be based on previous year focus areas of the upsc based on that is what we are going to be covering with respect to this area as well this is paper 1 and as you can probably understand from what i have told you quite a big area to cover there is no denying the fact that there is quite a big area to cover okay paper 1 is that now coming to paper 2 paper 2 is there are two different uh, differing opinions with respect to paper 2 the differing opinions are some people find paper 2 very easy to cover because they feel okay i can just read one book so there will be one book called india since independence or something like that for pre independence we will always have to refer to a different book but post independence there are certain books which have already been written by authors you might have heard of a book called as mishra puri or uma kapila these are certain books that are there some people might even have suggested this for gs which is not necessary but economic history of india whatever book gives you if you read that book you will get to know all that has happened in india the only thing is not gaining this knowledge is in presenting the answer so in paper 2 it is not the knowledge that matters it is quite easy to get the knowledge it's about presenting the answer and presenting the answer means most of the answers you will have to substantiate with data especially past events in the pre independence and pre liberalization era almost every answer has to be substantiated with numbers and that is going to be the biggest challenge so our challenge is going to be what is the easiest approach by which we can remember these numbers okay it is practically very difficult for many people just to memorize some numbers so we'll have to find some easy way to approach it so create some patterns uh, remember it in certain way are they expecting us to be very precise with respect to number no but should numbers be there in the answer yes so that is the challenge so it's more than about the learning of the subject it's about trying to answer a lot of questions and presenting it and evolving your answer writing with respect to that in paper one learning itself is going to be a challenge and then comes writing answers writing answer is going to be comparatively easy because there is a question there is only one possible way of writing the answer the theory has to be explained that's all there is no trickery in writing answers or no extra score you draw a very good graph you will be able to get good marks in paper one so draw a graph explain the graph you're done paper two that is not the case you give the same question to two people who both know the answer they might write very different answers to it and one person's answer might be better than another person's answer whereas in paper one that's not the case two people have studied that particular logic you give it to them they'll draw the same graph they'll give the same explanation and both might end up getting the same marks so here the focus should be on writing answers the more answers we write the better we get at the subject whereas in paper one the more we study and simplify the concept and the more we practice graphs like better we are going to get marks in with respect to that okay so we look at specifically inside the syllabus itself land system and its changes that is where the zamindari system right wari there are different systems that were there commercialization of agriculture before the arrival of the britishers indian agriculture was not of a commercial nature we were producing for consumption so the how did the change happen what are the crops which were created with commerce as the intention that we look at then there are some economic critiques of british rule which have been given very famous person here being dada bai nauroji he has commented on how the britishers have looted india uh, using you uh, know their various mechanisms of looting wealth from india which on the face of it might not seem like loot but in reality what it is actually looting to give example they have looked at how the manufacturing sector how the transport sector has evolved to prove the point that drain of wealth is what has happened okay railways they uh, talk about as a great uh, you know initiative of theirs but ultimately why was railways created in one line to give an answer to get raw materials from rural regions so that they can take it to their industries in britain manufacture produce the final goods and make it available sell it in the market they looked at indian villages and india only as a market for their market whatever was convenient they did that not for the welfare of indians or anything plus to mobilize troops if there is some unrest somewhere or some trouble somewhere quickly can you get your armed forces over there if it was for india why would they segregate and say indians are not allowed in certain coaches and all those things so those are the kind of critics that we would be focusing on with respect to uh, railways jute industry cotton industry with respect to access to money credit loan system all those things so this is what we are going to be focusing on very limited area of study uh, once we get the notes ready maybe you can have a uh, Uh, 20 or 30 page note okay for this there is nothing to add to it in fact 
you can actually be prepared for the questions that can come in the examination. There are only a predefined number of questions that can be asked from this area. Ask 10 mark, 15 mark and 20 mark. If we can have ready answers with you, you need not even think about it while writing the answer. You can just go and okay, it's a 15 mark. I know the three pages that I have to write, write the answer and come. You, are, you can save a lot of time in this area and you can score a lot of marks as well because you can go to the exam hall with pre-prepared answers. The same is true with respect to the pre-liberalization era as well. So first we are going to be talking about contributions of certain economists again in the post-independence but pre-liberalization period. Then specifically with respect to sectors, agriculture, industry, services, not a focus area prior to 1991. So agriculture and industry is the focus plus other areas like uh, income levels in India post from 1950 to 1991. So national income per capita income and the patterns and changes there on. Uh, broad factors which played a role in creating income. How did that income come? Where did that income come from? How did it get distributed? And issues with the distribution which resulted in poverty, trends in poverty and inequality, unemployment. These are the areas that we focus on. So everything, an analysis of India till 1991, Indian economy till 1991 after independence. That is what this area is. Again, we can go with pre-prepared answers. The data is not going to change. The areas are not going to change. The questions may not be as predictable as here, but still the answers we can prepare. There is only so much content. There is no addition that will be there after your basic level of preparation is over. Okay, That is with respect, respect to this area and this area. Now comes a third area, the post-liberalization era. There are going to be a lot of static areas here also. For example, look at this new economic reform and agriculture. Agriculture and WTO. So in 1991, when we brought about the reforms, what were the immediate after effects of that? When WTO was created in 1995 and India became a member of that, what has been the relationship between India and WTO? Unless some major change happens with respect to this and you see about it in the news, there is nothing to update ourselves with respect to it. And if it happens in the news, whether your optional is economics or not, you have to study that for your general studies perspective. So those things are, the updation is something that you will anyway have to do. So with respect to agriculture, with respect to industry, with respect to trade, again, new policies, with respect to currency exchange rate, how the currency exchange rate has changed, with respect to government policy, which is what is public policy, new economic policy and public policy, how public finance, how it has changed, how has the money system changed after the new economic policy, how has the planning system changed. In fact, they have not updated this yet. We have moved away from a centralized planning to the Niti Aayog system. Although they don't mention it in the syllabus, you have to study that as well. Because it's understood when they say planning, they're also talking about the Niti Aayog and the updation to the planning that has happened. It is not explicitly given in the syllabus. And a new economic policy and employment. How has employment uh, changed over the years? Employment patterns, employment laws, schemes like MG, NRE, GA, employment guarantee schemes or the new employment guarantee scheme. That So this is where I said you have to update yourself. In the current budget, they have given a new employment generation scheme. So that you have to update yourself and add to your answer. A simple analysis of the budget, which anyway I have to do as a general studies aspirant, a little more detail, a little more focus on the specific areas is all that would be required. Or in other words, I can even say every year you update yourself with the economic survey. There is something called as an economic survey. Key highlights of the economic survey you pick on and you update yourself with respect to that. That is the updation that, you, that would be required. That is the only thing that I would say you will have to update with every passing year. And if you are someone who's going to get through in the first attempt, you don't have to worry about that. And that should be a thought process at any every time. You should not be thinking about, oh, if I am going to be preparing for three years, then I have to update myself. No, why should you think about that? You should think of, think of this year. In this year, it's a defined syllabus that's going to be there. Okay. If at all, you are, let's say you are, a, you are not yet eligible to write, you are preparing early, then how do you have to update yourself? Yeah, then yes. This one area, economic survey or updates that have happened in the economy. Economic survey is not something uh, uh, completely new. Economic survey is just a compilation of all the economic events that have happened in the uh, year. So if you are a regular reader of newspaper, you already know what is inside the economic survey. That analysis alone is something that might give you a perspective, but most of the content inside you would already be aware of. So this is what is there in paper two. Okay. So this is a broad idea about paper one and paper two. Once again, going back to paper one, Focusing on areas of significance. Again, I'm not telling you that there is a blueprint saying this area is important, this area is not important. It's not like that. But still, the general pattern says out of the uh, 400 marks worth of questions that are asked, somewhere around 80 to 100 marks of question is going to appear from microeconomics alone. 
Okay, so that is one very significant area of focus. About 80 to 100 marks is going to come from macro and monetary. This area and this A, macro monetary together, about 80 to 100 marks. About 80 to 100 marks would come from international economics. And about 80 to 100 marks would come from growth and development. So 400 marks, four areas. About 10, 20 marks would come from public finance. If it comes from public finance, it will go away from some of the other areas. That's why I say 80 to 100. If you keep it as 100, four areas. Micro, macro monetary, uh, international growth and development. 100, 100, 100, 100. These are the focus areas. And usually there is a trend where what UPC does is they, they the question itself is divided into part A and part B. Part A, there are four questions. Part B, there are four questions, each of 50 marks each. In part A, usually the focus is microeconomics, macro and monetary. Part B, public finance is slight of an overlap. Sometimes it will come there, sometimes it will come here. Part B, you have international economics, growth and development. This is the trend that is there, but they have broken this trend many times where they have asked questions from international and growth and development in part A, questions from micro macro in part B. They have done that, but most years they follow this kind of a cut off and because they break itself we cannot say okay i'll study micro but not macro i'll study international but not growth and development that we cannot do we have to study everything every area we have to study we don't have a choice if we are lucky and some area we are not quite strong at and if we can let it go in a choice it is good for us because we can leave 150 marks worth of questions okay but we cannot go anticipating that what if they don't ask like that which means every area is of significance over here that is with respect to paper one. With respect to paper two, how it would look like is this pre-liberalization plus post-liberalization. Sorry, pre-independence plus pre-liberalization. -pre These two together account for out of uh, 400, let's say somewhere around 200 marks would come from here. Or out of 250, somewhere around 125 marks would come from here. So this is half. The post-liberalization period takes the remaining half. So 400 can again be divided to 200 and 200. 200 from one area, 200 from the... A little bit of extra would be there for post-liberalization actually because it's an evolving area. So maybe uh, out of 400, 220, 180. That would be more or less the split. But roughly speaking, this pre-independence and pre-liberalization together accounts for half. The remaining half is this post-liberalization period. This is the broad split as well. Again, you don't we don't have a scope for leaving any area. But usually the pattern is part A is about pre-independence and pre-liberalization. Part B is about post-liberalization. That's how the pattern most years is, but not always. Most years, that is the pattern that they follow as well. Okay. So this is the basic idea about the various sub-components of the subject, the syllabus, the various sub-components of the subject, uh, and the weightages to these areas as well. Okay. Should I take a previous year question paper, not to look at each individual question because you may not be able to understand those questions, but just to get a view about the question paper pattern in case you have not seen, I'll show that and then I'll get into how the class is going to be run. We'll take the most recent one, 2023 paper, we'll take a look. So this is paper one. Now in the instructions, it's given, but let me just show it to you. So this is section A, okay? Section A always has four questions. This is question number one. Question number one has five subsections inside it. If you choose question number one, you have to attend all five. In fact, you don't have a choice. You must attend question number one and question number five. Every question paper, because it's explicitly given in the syllabus. Questions number one and five are compulsory. Okay? Question number one is in the first question of section A. And question number five is the first question of section B. Both the questions are usually of the pattern where under one segment, there are five 10 mark questions. So there are five 10 mark questions, each 10, A, B, C, D, E. And here also we have A, B, C, D, E. Five 10 mark questions compulsorily you have to attend. 
okay you don't have a choice and within this you will have questions from in the first segment you will have questions from micro macro monetary all three maybe public finance also in fifth also you will have questions from uh, usually from international economics growth and development and from public finance so public if they ask about public finance but public finance is very uh, at most they'll ask one or two questions not more than that that has been the trend i have never seen a question paper where they have asked more than two questions most years only one question that was a 10 or a 15 mark question is what they ask okay so if they follow common pattern then question number 1 will only have questions from micro macro monetary question number 5 will have questions from international growth and development uh, and public finance in one of these areas that's how it is but they have broken pattern there have been years where international and growth and development have been asked along with micro and macro in section a itself so i won't tell you uh, that this this is how the pattern is going to be but general trend so question number 1 question number 5 is compulsory so 100 marks you have to attend you don't have a choice with respect to that in the remaining 300 marks uh, no four, uh, yeah 300 marks that is there 300 is every question is 50 marks right which means six more questions are there out of eight questions in total two questions are compulsory one and five are compulsory this is question number 2 2 itself has three segments a b c the usual pattern is to break it into three questions 20 15 and 15 20 plus 15 35 plus 15 50 50 marks if you choose two you have to attend all three within this you don't have a choice you can either choose two or you can choose three or you can choose four three again is three questions four again is three questions once you choose one question number abc is compulsory within that you don't have an option okay now how the rules are is question number 1 you have to attend question number 5 you have to attend there are six questions right out of the six six more questions out of the six you have to attend three more questions because total five questions is what you have to attend 5 into 50 is 250 out of the three additional questions that you have to attend you have to choose at least one from one part which means you cannot choose to attempt 1 2 3 and 4 from first part you choose one you choose at least one more question from here and at least one more question from the next segment and two questions from some segment in the sense total of three questions you will attend from one segment and two questions you will attend from the other segment that's how it is going to be okay so out of question 3 uh, 2 3 and 4 you have to choose one or two depending on which questions you know better and out of questions 5 6 7 and 8 5 you have to attend plus at least one but if you have chosen only one from the first part one more from the first part you have to attend two from this among these questions okay when i say it for the first time if you are listening to this for the first time it might seem a little confusing there is nothing confusing about it if you want the simpler way of putting it they have defined over here question numbers as a candidate has to attempt five questions in all Uh, so there are eight questions divided into two sections a candidate has attempted five questions in all question numbers 1 and 5 are compulsory and out of the remaining three are to be attempted choosing at least one question from each section so that's the logic okay uh, once you look at the question paper you will find it very easy to understand there is nothing complicated about it. so there are five 50 mark questions that you have to attempt in this question paper i feel that they have used the mechanism of uh, um, not dividing it into micro macro monetary and they have asked one question from about taxation which is about public finance that's a 15 mark question that is all one 15 mark from public finance there is nothing else which is asked from public finance some years they ask a mathematical question but it won't be very difficult in fact we we won't be specifically preparing for mathematical questions because the question doesn't the area doesn't focus on mathematics at all uh but these kind of mathematical numerical mathematical questions if they ask they are going to be very very easy and straight forward the textbook that you are using as a reference they would have given these as sample problems you just need to go through it because these questions are like easy marks this is 20 marks worth of question that they have asked so 10 plus 10 20 marks worth of question very easy you will be able to write it in half the time that you require for writing a detailed 20 mark answer if you don't have an aversion towards numerical mathematical questions if you have a predetermined mind oh i cannot answer number quest number numerical problems then you are in trouble then you will have to leave it you can still choose to leave six there will be no other mathematical question look at it there is no other mathematical question there are some years where they don't ask mathematical numerical mathematical questions at all okay is the question paper clear paper 1 paper 2 
same logic everything is same section uh, question 1 and 5 is compulsory out of the remaining 6 you have to attempt 3 1 from each area everything is the same you take a look at the question at your own time you will understand these questions are all going to be uh, one is usually from pre uh, independence and pre liberalization era 2 3 and uh, 4 is also going to be like that yeah so specific pre economic reform period pre independence era then you have uh, agricultural land holding which is a 1970 to 1980 is a timeline given till 1991 is what is the first part Godgill, that name was given. Vakil Godgill uh, Brahmananda was a name that was given there in the syllabus. Post independence uh, economists. These are the names. Sorry, this is moved on. Vakil Godgill, we care, we're out. Uh, from them, at least one economist every year they'll ask the question. So there are certain areas which are sure shot as well. Okay, so that is the trend. But when you come here, section B, it is about post-economic reform period, 2009, action plan for disinvestment, uh, 12th finance commission. So they might ask about subsequent finance commissions also. Then liquidity adjustment facility, which is more recent, universal basic income as a concept, which talks, all of these are more modern concepts about uh, the WTO in India, targeted PDS more recently, Italian features of uh, FEMA 1999, but a comparative one. How does it deviate from the pre previous one, pre-liberalization era one? That is something that they are asking. Then 1992 event that has happened, post-economic reform period, post-economic reform period. So that's how the questions are. So broadly, that is how they do the classification into two segments. Okay. I am not going into the details of the questions because at this stage, you may not be in a position to understand the questions. Otherwise, I would. So if you are uh, opting for economics as an optional, we will be analyzing these questions in class. As and when we cover topics, we will be taking these questions and analyzing them. Okay. And every time we cover a, a topic, we would also be looking at what could potentially be a question. How could this be asked as a question? It's also something that we'd be discussing in class as we go on with the classes. Okay. All right. So um, now about the subject and the class itself. How the class is going to be is first something that I'll discuss first. Then I'll talk about uh, the subject and whether you should consider it as an option or not. Uh, the classes will go for six months. That's a given. It will go till the end of March. Last year, we started a little late in the sense mid-October is when we started. It went till uh, mid of April. So This time we are uh, starting towards the end of September. The reason why we do that is to end it by end of March. Okay. So we will be able to finish it by March. But the syllabus is vast and we actually require close to eight months to cover. That is the timeline that I have looked at. I've been teaching it for a while now. So that is a timeline that is required. So because we don't have, we cannot afford to have classes in April and uh, May. Last year we extended because the prelims also got extended because of the elections. It did not, it happened one month later than what was planned or close to one month after what it was supposed to happen. So we were able to extend it. Uh, we can't afford to go beyond March, then you will not have time for your prelims preparation. So to ensure that we don't rush through topics, we have to have extra classes. That will be, I'm telling you this now itself. The optional class is a weekend batch. 9 to 1, 130 is, 9 to 1 or 130 is going to be the class. Every weekend we will definitely have class unless there is a national holiday or in case I'm traveling out of town or something, we will be doing that. Uh, however, in order for completion of syllabus, we will, right from the beginning itself, we will have classes in weekdays also, but not more than two days in a week. Any two days, not consecutive days, mostly it's one alternative day, Tuesday, Thursday, or uh, preferably I don't want class on Monday and Friday because anyway, you would have had a class on Sunday. Again, having a class on Monday is not convenient. And Friday again, Saturday, we'll have a class. I try to avoid classes on Monday and Friday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of these three days, two days we are likely to have. And that too, not every week. Okay. We won't have classes every week. Um, we will have classes... If necessary, two days a week, sometimes only one day a week, uh, not three days a week. If there is a very pressing need for it, maybe three days a week, but I won't, I don't expect even, I don't think I'll be able to survive with taking that, that many classes. So two days is what I'm looking at. Mostly I'll set it in my mind that it's going to be Tuesday, Thursday, but I'm not guaranteeing that. We'll have to have some flexibility. Uh, the weekday classes would be in the evenings after all your classes here. 
uh, are over. 5.30 to 8 is what I'm looking at, but more or less it will be 6 to 8, 2 hours. Weekend, it will be 4 hours of class. Weekday, it will be 2 hours. So, two weekday classes will be equivalent to one weekend class. That's how it is. So, it's effectively like one extra class that we are having through two days. That's how the class is going to be. Okay. So, this is we in order to complete the syllabus without rushing conveniently by uh, looking at uh, possible uh, previous year questions and how this can be questions and all this, it will take us that time. We require that time without which practically it's not possible to cover the syllabus. Okay. Um, we will not have a dedicated test series as part of the six months of preparation. Because my experience, I have tried giving test series as a part of this itself. My experience has been people don't write tests. Because every day, if you have four hours of class, that's going to be close to 100 pages that we'd be covering during that time. Just to talk about it, number of pages. 100 pages that we'd be covering. So in that 100 pages, to revise it itself, it's going to be a challenge. If I keep a test on past areas, people find it, students find it very difficult to write as a test. So what we'll do instead of a dedicated test series during this time period is we'll have class tests where I'll tell you one question a day or at the end of uh, one week, every week, one or two questions. I'll tell you in class, I'll tell you on Saturday or I'll post it in the group saying this particular question we are going to write as a test. I will tell you the question. You practice, you study it. You even practice writing at home if you want. And then when you come here, you write it like a proper test during a time that is given 9 to 9.30 or 12.30 uh, to 1 or some time like that, you don't sit and study at that point of time. You can do all the studies. I'll tell you the question itself. In the exam, you come to the classroom and during that half an hour, one or two questions we will write as a test. And then and there, I will tell you how to approach the answer. So I'm not going to sit and evaluate each paper. I will ask you to evaluate based on the guidelines that I give you so that you also look at it from the evaluator's perspective. You get better at it. Plus, you will be offered a test series with no additional cost when we after your prelims when there is a dedicated test series that is happening which will start say towards end of uh, uh, june end of june june may end or june is when you write your prelims end of june onwards we will be having a economics test series at that time you will be automatically enrolled into it you can write the test series like a proper test i'll give you syllabus i'll break it down into many small parts like microeconomics itself will be divided into three parts macro into two parts monetary into one part, those, these kind of classifications would be there. You will be given the syllabus, you will be given a schedule. On the schedule date, you can come and take the test and that will be evaluated properly and given to you. Okay, So that will happen. That is part of this course itself, but it won't happen during your uh, class time because it has not been useful for people is what I have seen so far. But if you really want it, I can share previous test series questions with you. If you want to write, you can do that but not as a dedicated slot. That is out of your own interest. You come and ask me, I'll be happy to share questions. I mean, you want to write a proper 10 question test, then I can do that as well. But that's not a general thing for the class. If you come and ask me, I can do that. For you. Okay. So this is how the class is going to be. Now there is one more faculty who is going to be involved in covering this for paper two, as far as we have discussed for um, pre-independence and pre-liberalization alone. Uh, he is going to be involved. He is an Indian Forest Service officer. So during his spare time, he comes and teaches. So um, every weekend or alternate weekend, one class of three or four hours, he'd be covering. That will be an exclusively online session because he's not in Chennai. He'll be taking from last year. He was taking from uh, Sri Lanka, I think. This year, I think he's in India. So he might be doing it. Only that part. Uh, as per our current discussion, he did the entire paper to last year. But as per our current discussion, I think I'll be doing the post-liberalization part where we'll have to update ourselves with current affairs or discussing economic survey and all those things. Because February economic survey will be released. January 30, economic 30, 31 economic survey, survey will be released. So in our later part, we can actually have classroom discussions on the economic survey with your participation. Because it's a new document for me also, what will be released next year. So all of us will put in effort together and you know, present it and learn the economic survey in that manner so that it is not one person's responsibility to sit and learn the whole thing. Okay, So we'll do that. So this is the current plan because of paucity of time, he has, we have sort of agreed upon the post-liberalization part being taken up by me. So this is how the trend is going to be. None of my classes will be online. I will, every class will be offline. I will be here, except if there is a compelling circumstance where I have to travel out of town for, you might know this, that out, outstation branch also, we ourselves are the ones who are going and taking. If I go also, I'll make sure that Monday to Friday is what the class is going to be. I'll make sure to be back here. 
if there is a compulsory compelling circumstance where i have to stay back for a weekend there if that is the case i'll try to arrange paper to class during those weekends uh, because then that is anyway online but if that is not possible i will keep it as an online class but only paper 2 not paper 1 the paper one theory i don't want to take it online at all because graphs everything the clarity of that is very very important so as much as possible last year i don't think there was a single online class that i did the year before that there were a few online classes because i had some personal issues going on so it the classes won't be online except for that paper two part paper two which is handled by that uh, second faculty there that alone would be online that will definitely be online there is no doubt about it okay uh, my part of it will entirely be off okay this is with respect to the class now who can consider economics as an optional um you should be good at mathematics to be good at understanding economics but not the conventional mathematics of your quadratic equations or differentiation integration all those things they are even numerical problems why do I, why did i specify with those questions numerical mathematical problems why did i say that is because entire economics is about mathematics but graphical mathematics not ma numerical mathematics about graph for every area of paper 1 you have to substantiate with graph microeconomics especially microeconomics has more complicated graphs everything is graph you draw the graph properly you write what is in the graph your answer is done out of 10 marks they will have no reason to reduce any marks at all but they cannot give you all 10 so they will reduce some marks if you draw a proper neat graph with pen pencil uh, with uh, pencil and scale preferably if or if you are very good at freehand drawing great but if not with uh, pencil and pen so sorry pencil and scale and you explain what is there properly and the graph has proper markings everything is there they'll have no reason to explain and you highlight the keywords in the explanation they'll know okay graph is all in proper order the keywords are highlighted they will not even go beyond that into reading your grammar is not good all those don't matter at all keywords matter the graph matters graph is also part of part of mathematics so if you have trouble with understanding graphs or drawing graphs then you should reconsider you should probably not take economics as an optional because if you cannot draw graphs you cannot write answers in economics paper 1 and if you are extremely challenged when it comes to remembering numbers and rounded numbers we don't even have to remember a data like 16.2 percentage 16.2 can be rounded off as when you learn roughly 15 percentage if you can round it off or you can remember it as 15 but in exam while you write you write it as 16.3 just make up it could be 16.3 it could be 16.2 it could be 15.9 who is going to look at it you remember it as 15 but don't write don't write it as 15 write it as 15.3 okay one one person if you can do that that's a bit of no data managing i won't use manipulation but data managing if you can do that then it will give an impression to the evaluator oh nalla bhayangaram padichir pole you can do some tricks like that and you can give an impression but you still have to remember that round data that 15 or 20 and you should be able to remember that if you are going to struggle with remembering those kind of data paper 2 you will be at some kind of a disadvantage but then again i think that is something that we can overcome you are if you don't like graphs or if you don't understand graphs i don't think that can be overcome because everything in paper 1 is with respect to graph everything paper 2 you struggle with numbers also you have to write numbers we can find some shortcuts to remember numbers some common trends and all those things we could probably look at doing that for remembering numbers so more than all those things the graph if you have an aversion to graph reconsider economics economics may not be your subject if you are intimidated by the volume of the subject if you feel oh it's too much and you are having double mind i say don't go for the subject because if you have double mind you will always have the double mind oh should i take it should i have taken that other subject look at that person who is studying so easily he is studying that subject so easily she is studying that subject look at the subject such a small syllabus syllabus is vast but consider the other possibility you take a subject whose syllabus is very small but you are not feeling any connection to the subject at all that small subject itself you will sit with it and you will study for many days you will not cross one page the volume won't matter if you really like the subject if you can really get into the subject the volume of the subject the size of the subject won't matter however i am not going to deny that many people including myself when i studied i found the volume of the subject to be a challenge another challenge that i found is economics is supposed to be a very rational subject rationality is the founding principle of economics as a subject they make completely irrational assumptions to begin with 
so that is also a challenge that we sometimes have how can you assume something like this for example you might all know that uh, the concept of law of demand right that when the price of a commodity falls people will consume more of it okay or when the price of a commodity rises people will consume less of it that lies on a basic principle assuming nothing else in the world changes with respect to money the person's income is not changing the person's taste and preference is not changing price of other commodities are not changing the producers are not changing anything all of these in reality will change or many of this will change but the theory cannot be explained if you have all these variabilities so we make a lot of as so called assumptions or unrealistic assumptions which we have to accept but the reason why the subject still survives is because in spite of those assumptions the theories are true the law of demand is true if you look at it generically when price of a commodity falls you will, you are likely to consume more of it in spite of all the unrealistic assumptions surrounding it the laws the theories are still true largely true so it makes sense to make those assumptions so for me again it was a big challenge for me how can you assume something like this i was not able to cross that in the initial stages so studying economics was a big challenge for me because they say everyone says it's a rational subject why can you why are you making so irrational assumption that you will have to accept that okay they are making this assumption for the sake of creating a theory even if you relax some of these assumptions the theory will still hold good so that is something that you will have to get used to these are some of the challenges that you would have in addition to these you might have your own unique challenges when you learn the subject i am there for that come and talk to me about the challenges what you are experiencing we will find a way to go around those or work around those challenges so this is going to be the uh, how the subject is going to be for you so i have told you about the syllabus i have told you shown you a sample of a question paper without going into the details of it i have told you uh, how the classes are going to be i have told you how the subject itself is going to be if you have any questions you can ask think about it online le that have they are something online uh, if you have any questions you want to talk to me you can raise your hand or you can unmute yourself if you have the option you have the option you can unmute yourself if you guys don't have any further question we can wind up the class okay do we have short there um very very less very rarely do they even ask questions derivations um give me what do you mean by derivation give me an example uh, in the initial part like law of demand there is we need to prove the law of demand so in those cases very very initial stages alone there might be some derivation largely no large it is not a determining factor in fact there is a little bit of numerical mathematics also in deriving whatever you spoke as derivation we might need to do differentiation okay but those are very very basic if you don't know any derivation also i can tell you in class this is what is that level of knowledge is enough in in one line i can tell you this you derive it this way this is the way of deriving you just memorize that you can do go a, go and do a little bit of uh, say background check after that you can learn at that point of time it is not going to be challenging it is not going to decide the nature of the subject itself for you those are very small areas okay and it's going to be very easy we have very very minor part not significant okay equations, but derivations correct uh, even equations are not equations in sense yeah this is equal so conditionality yeah. in economics we have a scenario called as equilibrium right this equilibrium is attained when this is equal to this right. that equation not equation like quadratic equation all those we don't have that we don't have at all okay or a straight line there will be a mathematical equation for a straight line so those kind of things might be there but those equations are not going to determine your understanding of subsequent areas even without the equations even if you don't understand any of the equations your understanding of the subject won't vary won't be affected understandings of the subjects are purely conceptual in nature in some of the derivations we don't even use uh, numerical mathematics what we use is uh, again geometry triangle you know in equilateral triangles these angles are equal if you have two parallel lines angles those kind of things you will have to again eighth standard or ninth standard you have studied this in geometry those again we will brush upon in class in similar triangles this is the case equilateral triangles this is the case those kind when graphically we are trying to prove a point this triangle is equal to this triangle so this is proved so those kind of again very very small areas not major areas 
mostly it is going to be like this triangle is small this triangle is big so this is a better option than this or if small is good this is a better option than this those kind of things is what we have theoretically there is a theory which has been stated how to prove the theory usually graphically is what we prove that is going to be there it is not even comparable like if there are 100 graphs there will be one equation that's how it is going to be in terms of complicated equations uh, uh, your differentiation and all those things but for every graph there is going to be that this equal to this that equation if you are considering as equation then every graph will have that but not complicated equations okay and the online okay you don't have any further questions we'll wind up the session with this so I'll update you on the date of uh, the starting of the class in the coming days. Okay. Sure. We'll wind up there. Thank you.